Story Warren Books presents The Last Archer, A Green Ember Story by S.D. Smith Narrated by Eric Fritschews Dedication to Lieutenant Colonel Matthew T. Schelling, U.S. Air Force, retired. Sit Dominus inter me et te usque in sempiternum and to all veterans and their families. Thank you. Chapter 1. Half-Wind Citadel Joe Shanks leapt from his bunk and darted for the door. He sped through the opening, then spun and ran back in. Shaking his head, he grabbed the bow propped against the bed frame and slipped the quiver over his shoulder. Joe buckled on his sword belt, snagged his coin purse, and headed for the door once more. It wouldn't do to show up at the muster without his weapons. He could only imagine what Captain Fry would say to that. Joe slowed down when he reached the entrance to Leaper's Hall, where a crowd had gathered around the open door. Huddled groups of rabbits talked earnestly with one another. Joe noticed angry and worried expressions. What's the word, Lund? he asked, grabbing his friend's arm. Shanks! Nice of you to wake up, Lund said with a smirk. Just in time for muster, as usual. I had a late night. At the targets, I assume? Lund patted Joe's bow. Listen, Shanks, you know I love you and your long, goofy legs. But if you think a few extra nights at the targets are going to make you a better archer than Nate Flynn, you're dreaming. It's been more than a few nights. Still, it's Nate Flynn. The Nate Flynn. I can beat him, Joe said, scowling. I have to beat him. Why do you need to beat him so badly? I have to prove that I've got what it takes. Who do you have to prove that to? Those brats who used to bully you? That's one. Lieutenant Drand? Two. That beautiful doe? Ah, uh, Misty? Who rejected your invitation to the summer mingle? That's three. Didn't she say she'd rather stay the summer single than go with you to the summer mingle? Lund asked, smirking. Three. Captain Fry? Four, Joe said, frowning. And, Lund continued slowly, your father's ghost? That's five, Joe said quietly. A handful to start with. There are more, Lund asked, then nodded. Of course there are more. You're ridiculous, Joe. I don't know why you beat yourself up. You're an incredible archer. You don't need to prove it to anyone. I have to prove it to myself, Lund. Okay, okay, Lund said, raising his hands with a smile. Like I always say, I'm behind you all the way. Sadly, I'll be so far behind you that it won't help any, but I'm definitely behind you. Joe smiled, his scowl giving way to a laugh. So what's got everyone so riled up? Surely it's not the Archer's Cup. Yeah, no one cares about that, because everyone knows that Nate's going to win. I thought you had my back. I'm just saying what they think. What do they know? Just because he's won every archery competition that's ever been held within a hundred leagues of his presence, it doesn't mean he'll win this one. You and I know that you definitely have a chance. Thanks, Lund. He might die, or go blind, Lund said. You have a chance, Shanks. Joe shook his head. Just then, Captain Fry, a stout older buck in an impeccable uniform, appeared around the corner. Make way there, he called, glowering as he marched ahead. Flanked by several grim-faced counselors, he hurried through the press of rabbits and into Leaper's Hall. The crowd quieted as they passed. When they were all inside, the noise level rose again. Joe looked up at Lund. Lord Rake has called for a citadel congress at Cloud Mountain, Lund said, concern plain on his face. They've known about it for a little while, he said, nodding to Leaper's Hall. But word just got out and they're making a decision. They say Lord Ramner might go. Many of the other citadels are already there. It's probably a trap, Joe said, shaking his head. Isn't Lord Rake a long treader dupe? It gets worse, Lund said, nodding. They say Wilfred Longtreader is actually there. At Cloud Mountain? Joe asked, his eyes wide. And they haven't arrested him? No, Lund said, speaking louder to be heard above the swelling noise in the corridor. Lantrell Baker said Wilfred Longtreader has the run of the place. They don't even keep a guard on him. 
and there are two more long treaders with him, possibly three. Unforgivable, Joe said, after what they did to betray the king. Think of everyone who lost loved ones when the long treaders betrayed the king to be murdered by Morbin. My mother, Joe whispered, teeth clenched. The lords wonder why we can't unite to fight Morbin, Lund said, while some of them harbor the villains who gave our king and kingdom away. Joe felt the anger inside him fan into flame. Most rabbits at Halfwind grew up hating the name Long Treader, but for Joe, it was personal. They should pay. If the lords don't act, the worst will happen. I hope Jupiter's heir stays as far away from Cloud Mountain as he can. Chapter 2 Joe squeezed through the crowd, carefully guarding his bow, and then sped through the passage toward the mess. He stepped in and snagged a bag of ready provisions, then hurried out, harassed by the cook's angry shouts. Joe didn't have much time, and he could not be late again. Captain Fry would have him shipped to Morbin in a bag. Joe ate as he walked quickly toward the gate, then he ducked into the hospital. He slowed down as he entered, looking back and forth, before handing off his jingling coin purse to an elderly votary. For the widows again, Joe? The blue-robed sister asked. Yes, ma'am, Joe answered, touching his ears, his eyes, then his mouth. I'm so grateful to you for seeing to this, Sister Layla. But young Joe, Layla said, looking into the purse, this is most of your pay again. You can't give all this. He smiled at her and thanked her again. I'm sorry, sister. I have to go. I'll be late. Without looking back, he hurried into the hall and ran for the gate. He saluted the sentries and dashed out to Westfield. He passed the rest of his battalion, already there as the bell tolled. He was in place and at attention before the ringing stopped. Arms out, Lieutenant Dran called, and each buck in line presented his sword for inspection. Captain Fry wasn't reviewing this morning, so Joe had to deal with Drand, his second least favorite officer at Half Wind Citadel. He inhaled sharply and looked sideways at the approaching lieutenant. Lieutenant Drand reached him, stopped, and squinted at Joe's sword. Then he carefully took it in his hands and examined it closely. Not good enough, Shanks, Drand said. A buck's blade reflects his soul. I see murk and film. What do you mean by showing up at divisions with an ill-kept blade? Uh, sir, Joe stammered, I've been focused on my bow. I, I usually... I just reviewed Nate Flynn and his bracers, Drand interrupted. Did you know that he begged to be mustered earlier so he could get to his own training sooner? And guess what? His sword was immaculate. He also didn't have crumbs dribbling off his chin. Joe swiped his mouth, looking down as Lieutenant Drand went on. I seriously consider barring you from the Archer's Cup finals today. Please, sir, Joe said, eyes locked on the angry officer. Don't do that. I'll do whatever you ask. Please, sir, I need to win that cup. Lieutenant Drand squinted at Joe, an angry scowl blooming. You need? You need? Son, I don't know if you've heard the news. Probably not because you just rolled out of bed in time to bolt some stolen provisions and lurch to divisions. But there are traitors on the loose in our sister citadel. There's a war coming, and our side can't seem to find enough backbone to pay back the family who gave up our king. Some of us are going to Cloud Mountain. You need to win an archery cup. He shoved Joe's sword back at him, knocking him back so he slid on the wet grass. You need to wake up to what's going on in the world. Drand walked on. Joe got to his feet, resumed his place, and stood at attention until the muster broke. He went through the motions at each energetic drill and listened absently while the fighting forms perfected at half wind were emphasized again. The soldiers went through their assembly attack drills, beginning with the rhythmic thrumming, and called commands with energy and focus, but not Joe. He was there in body, but his heart wasn't in it. When combat simulation training came, they lined up four deep on each side in single file, and the first two bucks fought. When one fell to the ground, the second in line would move forward to take on the advancing battler. They battled until one soldier had fought his way through all four fighters. This drill was called Combat Rush, and was meant to simulate the close-quarter fighting they could all expect to be in when the war began in earnest. Joe was third in line behind two weak fighters, and he knew he would see action soon. 
His frustration mounted as he thought of Lieutenant Dran's words, especially since somewhere inside he suspected that the older officer was right. Joe funneled all that feeling into the silo deep inside that told him he wasn't good enough. He would never be good enough. The first buck stepped forward and the sergeant shouted, Engage! The enormous buck across from Joe's line growled and rushed ahead, sidestepping a wild punch and shouldering down his first opponent with some ease. He rushed the second, who ducked a blow and landed a kick to his stomach, but the bigger rabbit only caught the kicking foot and twisted the kicker down. Joe was up. He darted forward and ducked a devastating punch, moving behind the stout buck. Joe quickly reversed so that he was back to back with his opponent, then bent back to take the soldier across the chest with his arm, dragging him backward to trip over Joe's poised leg. The stout rabbit went down, cursing at his defeat. Joe surged ahead to meet the next, fresher opponent. Joe fainted left, then rose quickly in a leap, toppling him with a solid kick to his chest. Joe landed and barely had time to switch his attention before the third buck was on him. Joe felt a surge of anger grip him, and he blocked the buck's rushing strike with an emphatic move that opened up his opponent to a staggering gut punch so that Joe's spinning kick sent him to the ground with a thud. The last opponent came hard at Joe with a feint of his own. Joe bought it and dodged straight into the path of his attacker's hard kick. He crumpled to the ground, his mouth bleeding, his anger stoked all the more. He got to his feet, shrugged off the medic who rushed to him, and walked away. Chapter 3 When they broke at lunchtime, Joe wandered aimlessly around the grounds outside the citadel. He wasn't hungry, at least not for food. He walked away from Westfield and through a series of paths overhung with thorn-woven canopies. He finally issued into a small glade where the swish and thud of archers was easy to hear. He crept to the edge of the bushes and peered through. Of course he had come here. Where else? Nate Flynn shot at far targets as a gentle rain began. He had six companions with him, and Joe recognized the patch on their shoulders. It featured a furry forearm with an archer's arm guard leading up to a fist clenching two arrows. The bracers were an elite team of archers, ready to be deployed in battle when only the truest aim would do. They were named after the arm guard that archers often used, called a bracer, and for their skill at firing two arrows and one shot. Joe had spoken with a few of them, and had once been in a mandatory tactics class with Kent Hallman. Joe had never seen the bracers at training, but had always wondered what it was like. He had so far studiously avoided Nate Flynn, seeing him only occasionally. Joe peered through the drizzle as Nate took his place. An aide ran across the far side of the glade with a long wooden shield blocking his entire body. The shield bore a crude depiction of a wolf. Nate sent two arrows, which both found the moving shield dead center, just as his fellows rushed him. Before Nate could get another arrow off, he was knocked to the ground, spilling his quiver. They shoved him roughly and struck at his arms. Clinging to his bow, he leaned into a hard shove then balanced as he snagged an arrow from the pile on the ground. Faster than Joe thought possible, he knocked and fired three arrows in turn, each finding the wooden shield borne by the scrambling rabbit. Hold! a watching rabbit barked. It was their mentor, an aged archer of great reputation, Clay Fletcher. The team relaxed, except for Nate. It has to be faster, Nate called. Bring more shields, and they must move in a less predictable pattern. And Junder, you should have hit me harder. That was too soft. You really have to put me off my shot. I don't want to injure you ahead of the cop, Junder said, looking down. Curse the cop, Nate Flynn shouted. I want to win the war. Captain Fry's orders stand, Nate, Master Fletcher said, walking up slowly. You're right that we can all do better here, and we will. But Junder's right that these cups do matter. They matter because we need to inspire archers to practice hard and see the glory in it. Are the Harborn Citadel archers not revered? Nate asked, clearly frustrated. They don't waste their time on cups and shows. They prepare for the war. They fight. And so do we, Master Fletcher said, coming alongside Nate. 
I love your zeal, Nate, but we need you to be a leader here, and you can only lead rabbits from where they are, not from where you wish they were. He put his arm around Nate's shoulder, and they walked to the far side of the field, the old buck speaking earnestly as they walked along. Joe frowned. He had never realized that Nate didn't enjoy the archery cups, that the glory Joe thought was so important was an irritating distraction for him. Joe walked away, head down, and wound his way back through the tunnels and into the warren that was half-wind. Passing several votaries, who were walking in procession out of Leaper's Hall, he made his way back to his bunk and collapsed on it. Shanks, wake up! Joe's eyes shot open, and he reached back a fist to strike whoever was shaking him. He relaxed when he saw it was Lund. What do you want? It's time for the Archer's Cup. If you're not there in five minutes, you're disqualified. Joe sat up, frowning. I'm not going, Lund. What? This morning, there was nothing more important to you in the world. Yeah, and that was pretty pathetic. No, Shanks, I know I poke fun at you, but this cup is a big deal. It's one of the three principal cups, and it's an honor to compete in it, to place. Winning is a key for advancement. Maybe the only key for someone like you, with no connections. You still want to be an officer. I guess. Then let's go, Lund said, dragging him off his bunk. I've got your bow and quiver. Come on. Joe stood reluctantly, found he hadn't even taken off his sword, and jogged behind Lund all the way to Westfield. There, targets were set up and a crowd was gathered to watch the competition. Joe saw Nate Flynn standing with the bracers, a stoic look on his face that Joe had always thought was an indication of intense concentration. The bell rang twice as Lund ran up to the official, Master Fletcher himself, and pointed back at Joe. Master Fletcher frowned, then nodded. They jogged to the competitor's circle just as the bell rang out. Right on time again, Lund said, handing Joe his quiver and bow. Remember, Shanks, this is an opportunity to impress. If you can place in the top five, you're sure you're among the elite. Even top ten is good. Joe nodded. Thanks, Lund. Like I said, Shanks, I'm behind you all the way. Lund jogged back toward the spectator area, indicating the widening distance with hand gestures as he went. Way behind you, he shouted. Joe smiled, then turned back to the course. Distant targets were set up, and twenty archers stood within the competitor's circle. Master Fletcher raised his hands for silence. Welcome to the finals of the Archer's Cup. Chapter 4 Master Clay Fletcher called out over the crowd. The Archer's Cup finals are about to begin. Flanked by two silent officers, he continued as the crowd fell silent. By Lord Ramner's leave, we begin these finals with the most elite archers in our citadel. The Archer's Cup is an old competition passed down to us from better days, when Lord Ramner's grandfather held the first event at First Warren. It has been held every year since, even in our present days of distress. I saw King Jupiter himself hand the cup to my oldest brother. May the leapers keep him. He smiled at the archers. I saw the king hand the cup to Ran Boyer, legend of the Harbow archers. Now you have a chance to win the cup and claim the honor. The crowd cheered, and Joe felt his heart warm to the moment. Maybe this competition isn't as pointless as Nate thought. Maybe it does matter. It was, he knew, his one chance to advance. The image of his father appeared in his mind. His father's words echoed in his ears. The only way for the lowborn to rise is through glory. Ambition is the food of glory. The archers spread out along the lines, and Joe saw to his weapons. He carefully laid aside his sheathed sword. Still not clean, he remembered, and he looked up and around to see if Lieutenant Drand was nearby. He couldn't find Drand, and as he studied the gathered rabbits more closely, he saw that none of the senior officers were present, nor was Lord Ramner. They were, no doubt, conferring over the Citadel Congress invitation issued by Lord Rake of Cloud Mountain. It was just his luck to have his moment finally come, and no senior officers there to see it. Archers! Your first volley in one minute. 
Master Fletcher called. Joe saw that Nate Flynn was on the far side of the columns, and ten archers stood between them, including Junder and Duane Balder. Still, Joe caught sight of Nate's thorough preparations. The champion archer bent his eye along the shaft of his arrow and paid careful attention to the fletching. Joe followed his own routine. First, he felt along the shaft with his eyes closed, searching by touch for imperfections that might mean a small deviation in flight. He then examined it by eye, gently flicking the fletching to check its resilience. This done, he tested his bowstring and stepped to the line. He caught Nate's eye as the chief raised his hand, and the crowd held its breath. Nate's face was totally relaxed, and nothing could be read in his expression. Joe tensed in concentration, eyeing now the target some great distance away. He would have to aim a little high, add some extra strength. It wasn't close enough for a comfortable straight shot. He tried to relax, but his body felt as taut as his string. The arrow knocked, and he took a deep breath. Archers ready, Master Fletcher cried. Joe let his breath out slowly as he closed one eye and aimed along the arrow at the target. He drew back his bow. Fire! Joe hesitated a moment, then released his string. He could hear nothing but the thwick and swoosh as the arrow sped toward the target. He held his steady gaze along the shaft of the speeding dart and watched as it found the center circle. Joe inhaled as the sound around him returned, and he heard the gallery cheering loudly. His expression never changed. This was what he had prepared for, and it was no surprise. He checked his bow over, then went to his quiver to find his next best arrow, while the judges called out the names of archers who were eliminated. He knew that any who had not hit the center circle would be dismissed. When he turned back to the targets, he saw that half the archers were gone sullenly marching off toward the crowd, some receiving consoling pats on the back. None were smiling. The targets were being moved farther away still, and the remaining archers squinted at the distance. Joe glimpsed Nate's expressionless gaze and then closed his eyes. Inside his mind's eye, he saw the target, its center lit up like an ember. He focused on it, saw above the target the glowing words, Ambition. Glory. Rise. He opened his eyes just as Master Fletcher called out, Archers ready! Nothing else existed, only the steady beat of his heart, the calm rhythm of his breathing, and the target. Fire! Joe let go and sent his shaft slicing through the air to the distant mark. He didn't even watch it go home, so sure he was that it was headed precisely where he intended. He moved back toward his quiver as the thud of impact resounded and the crowd cheered, exclamations of amazement surrounding the gallery. He looked up and saw that Lord Ramner, Captain Fry, Lieutenant Cout, and Lieutenant Drand had all just arrived. They watched with grave attention as the marshals examined the shots. Captain Fry wore a scowl above crossed arms, as Lieutenant Drand spoke in his ear and nodded toward Joe. We have three archers remaining, Master Fletcher called as the spectators quieted. Kent Holman, Nate Flynn, and... Joe was choosing his next arrow. His eyes closed as he ran his hand along its length. Joe Shanks, these are the last three. Archers, take your places for the final round. Joe selected his arrow, turned and walked back to the line. The final three moved to the inside six columns, leaving a space between each. Joe was in the center with Nate on his left and Kent on his right. So I've beaten the rest of his crack archers. That's surely something. Only two more to surpass and I'm made. I'm somebody. Then he refocused, closed his eyes and visualized the target. He heard his father's words. He focused on the glory he would receive, the certainty that he would achieve something. He heard a murmur of voices and opened one eye. Captain Fry was talking in low tones to Master Fletcher. Clay Fletcher frowned, looked down, and then nodded. For the final round, Master Fletcher said, holding up his hands for attention, we will have some innovations. Innovations? Joe's steady breathing changed, and his focus wavered, his mind filled with questions. 
Soldiers were hauling buckets toward the field, and Captain Fry was giving more orders besides. Archers, please turn and kneel by your packs, Master Fletcher said. They obeyed, and Joe realized that this was to conceal the field from their view. Innovations? What can this mean? Before it had been simple. One rabbit, one target. That's all. Hit the center and you advance. That's how the cup had always been, as far as he knew. Now what? Joe listened and tried to perceive, through the noise of the murmuring crowd, what was happening behind him. He heard carts moving, liquid splashing, and feet pounding. It sounded like the rush before an all-citadel muster, mixed with a repair day. After what felt like half an hour, with hunger and worry gnawing at Joe, the master called them back to their lines. Everything was different. The field was obscured by bales and carts, barriers of all kinds sprawling all over. The grass was spoiled by black splashes, and Joe couldn't even tell what the objective had become. Where were the targets? Box, Captain Fry called, stepping in front of Clay Fletcher. The war is upon us. We have traitors to deal with, but with that done we may see action with the enemy very soon. A cheer broke out from the crowd. Most wore tunics bearing the symbol of the blood moon and cross spears over their chests. We are soldiers! and we are eager to fight, eager to get at the enemy, and our preparations must suit our purposes. Instead of just standing there securely protected while they aim at an unmoving object, these final three archers will be tested in an environment more like battle. This will be a true test of battle archery. Are you ready? Yes, Captain, Nate Flynn shouted. Kent and Joe nodded. Here are the rules. Captain Fry said. You must hit the two targets corresponding to your color in turn. Kent Holman will be blue, Nate Flynn white, and Joe Shanks red. The targets with your color will be visible only as you advance. There will be a final target, the upshot, that bears all three colors. Its center can only be struck once, as it will give way with a perfect shot. The first archer to hit his first two targets dead center, then knock out the center of the final target, will receive the cup, and, what's more, the honor due a battle archer. Joe's mind reeled as he tried to orient himself to the new rules. He was frustrated, but he tried to lay that aside and prepare for the trial. Just as he closed his eyes and began to focus, Captain Fry called, Begin! Begin! 